Aiken are pleased to be hosting our eighth event on building with natural material, and this time is the first of a mini series on retrofit. We've got some great minds from across the industry presenting tonight, followed by a panel session where the speakers will be able to answer your question posted in the chat box. So I'd like to introduce Chris Brookman from Back to Us and ASDP Natural Fiber Insulation Group, who will introduce us to the importance of natural materials in retrofit and their compatibility with existing building fabrics. Chris Morgan from John Gilbert Architects, who will highlight the points to consider when retrofitting with natural materials. And finally, Gregor Mitchell from Gregor Mitchell Architects, who, who will give us some guidance and a run through some case studies. Before we kick off, I'm sure most of you already know about ACAND and some are involved in the network, but for the benefit of others in the room, Andy will give us a brief introduction into who we are and what we do. So over to Andy. Hi everyone. For anyone new to ACAN, we are an open voluntary network of individuals uh, in the built environment industry. Uh, it was formed in April 2019 and has now grown into a global network of over 3,000 people. It started with a vision for how we could autonomously, as a collective of individuals, how, could, how we could work autonomously as a collective of individuals in order to make rapid decisions and respond quickly to the climate emergency. Our manifesto has three overarching aims, decarbonize now, ecological regeneration and cultural transformation. You can read a bit more, more detail about these here and on the ACAM website. ACAN is made up of many groups, including these main, nine main thematic groups, of which natural materials is one. Each group is made up of individuals who want to make change happen, and a couple of people from each group take a coordination role to help facilitate the group and any actions. You can hear more about what's going on in, each, in, in the other groups by joining ACAN, and we'll share a link to the other groups in the chat box later. Back to Aurora to introduce the speakers. Thank you, Andy. Um, so I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the night. So this is Chris Brookman from Back to Earth and ASDP Natural Fibre Installation Group. Back to Earth was started in 1995 and is still run by Chris Brookman, a chem chemistry graduate, and was originally a building company specialising in construction with sustainable material such as carbon lime. In 2007, the business was morphed into a material supplier, at which point Back to Earth's sole business was supplying business um, sustainable building materials. So over to Chris. Thank you, Aurora. Um, right, I will share my screen and attempt. Hopefully that's doing its thing. Excellent, okay, I'm gonna rattle through this a bit because I've probably put in too many slides, but anyway. So retrofitting your home with natural materials. Um, for the benefit of those who are new to this whole topic, um, when we're talking about natural materials, particularly in the, in the sense of uh, insulation, we're talking about mainly plant fibers or, or animal fibers. So these are uh, um, plant or animal uh, derived fibers. The main ones that we use in this country are hemp wool coming from the, the outside of the hemp plant, Sheep's wool, um, wood fiber actually makes up about 60, 65% of the market. And that's made from basically grinding up softwood and, and forming it into either flexible bats or, or rigid boards. Um, cork comes from the, the bark of the oak tree and cellulose is actually made from, from ground up recycled paper, which is blown into um, timber frames or attics or various different things. Um, so why would you bother retrofitting insulation, first of all? Um, it is, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of um, hassle involved in, in doing it. But basically, if you're living in a, in a solid masonry building, you will know how cold it is. And you'll know that pretty much at any time of the year, the external walls and the floor, if it's not insulated, um, it, it is cold. Um, and also everything that we do produces moisture. We whenever we breathe, whenever we wash, whenever we cook, whenever we make a cup of tea, you know, there's, there's moisture being produced all the time. And that moisture, um, when it interacts with very cold surfaces, condenses. So you can get a situation where you have very moist surfaces to your walls, 
which um, can encourage mold growth. Mold produces spores, which get into the atmosphere inside your home, um, which can actually uh, encourage things like pneumonia to, to form in your lungs. So it's, it's really bad for your health. So retrofitting insulation can, uh, uh, certainly internal insulation, uh, when that's fitted to the surface, you're raising the surface temperatures, you're improving the comfort enormously, um, you're removing any spaces for mold to grow, and also you're, you're saving energy, obviously, by insulating the walls. So it does make a huge difference. So that's really why, you know, you need to get on and, and insulate your building. Um, why would you use natural materials specifically rather than synthetic materials? Well, it, for us, certainly as a, as a supplier, it's all about functionality. All of the materials that we choose, we choose them because they are incredibly capable at doing not just one thing, but a whole range of things. Um, natural plant fibers tend to be very, very complex structures. They're not just a sort of a straight bit of whatever, cellulose or anything else. They tend to be very weird and wonderful um, structures, which have a lot of interesting surface chemistry, which gives them the, the ability to do a whole load of things that synthetic fibers don't do. Now, insulation um, really covers eight different areas, and I'm just going to go through those very quickly. So first of all, sound. Um, if you lived anywhere near um, Heathrow, you, <laughs> you'd be pretty hot on that. But it's generally the, the biggest source of complaint in buildings and, and attached buildings. So rows of terraces, semis, all that kind of thing. Um, and using very, very lightweight synthetic insulation doesn't help that. It, it's not very good at absorbing uh, sound. So acoustic insulation is largely governed by density and rigidity or lack of. So concrete, very, very dense, actually not very good for sound insulation. But materials that are dense, like wood fiber, but actually quite soft and extremely good at absorbing sound. Um, fire, a bit of a hot topic. Um, sorry, pardon the pun. Um, <laughs> Um, so when you're designing buildings, yes, you can pack it full of materials that on paper say that they don't burn, but in a fire, pretty much anything will burn or at least parts of the material will burn. And so materials such as PIR produce cyanide in a fire that the board itself might not burn, but when you heat it, you're getting cyanide off it. Some of the binders used in, um, in um, glass fibers, mineral fibers, um, release hydrogen chloride gas, which again is incredibly toxic. Um, and so although the fire might not injure you seriously, the, the smoke often does. So with natural fibers, you tend to find that they're a much denser product. They don't contain much oxygen. They will tend to char on the surface. And also because they're plant fibers, they don't generally release poisonous gases. Um, and so they're actually much more resistant than you might expect to a fire, albeit that they do eventually burn. Um, health. So, and this is not just about the occupants, it's about the installers as well. So contractors and installers are always exposed to a huge range of construction chemicals, um, and particularly in this case, fibres from, from insulation. And there are questions over what happens to your body when those fibres are in your lungs. Um, the fibres do eventually um, dissolve, but between the point of entry and them actually dissolving, you know, it's not really known what damage that does to your, to your body and, and how long that damage persists. Um, the binders that are used in those materials as well release VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Um, and if you're insulating internally, obviously those compounds are entering your airspace, which again is, is no good for your, your general health and respiratory health. Natural fibers generally don't contain VOCs. Wood fiber does contain a small amount, but uh, it tends to be quite quickly released. And uh, because we've obviously been around these, these um, plants for millennia, uh, the, the compounds that they release were, were quite comfortable with, quite used to. They're not, um, they're not uh, going to damage our health. Um, comfort. So our sense of comfort is derived from the infrared feedback that we get from the surfaces around us and being in a space which gently changes temperature. So that, you know, a space that doesn't need a huge amount of heating or a huge amount of cooling to keep it at a stable, stable temperature. Using um, very, very low, um, sorry, low density materials with, with very low thermal conductivity sounds great because it means you can build these sort of super slender walls to give you a low U value. But actually they achieve what's called an equilibrium state where the flow of heat through them um, levels out um, and actually, particularly in, in summer, they, they do tend to let quite a lot of heat into a building and quite easily overheat. So 
um, having some density there, having some mass actually balances out the internal environment and creates a much more stable interior, uh, giving you much greater levels of comfort. Um, this is not what you want your builder to be doing. Uh, so this is quickly about buildability. So we have a, a, a term in this country called the performance gap. And typically it's the, the difference between the design uh, energy usage and the, the actual real life energy usage. And typically that's about 30 to 40%. So it's, it's a huge amount. Um, and that is largely because some designs are just not, a, you know, not buildable. They look great on paper, but on, you know, in, in the real world, they're not particularly uh, buildable. Rigid boards like PIR shrink and actually rigid boards generally of, of any sort of material are nigh on impossible to fit between a timber frame. And so um, using, uh, using these kind of products, you get a lot of air gaps and this is where this, this performance gap comes in. Um, Natural fibers tend to be a different format of product. They tend to be much springier. They tend not to shrink. Um, and again, that, that sort of extra mass and, and the simplicity of design tends to work in reverse. So uh, we've got projects that have actually performed up to 75% better than uh, anticipated. So using these kind of fibers, you actually get a, a much better result and, and they tend to be a lot simpler. Uh, durability, um, people often assume that natural fibers you know, they're going to rot in the rain or, or you know, wood fibre will turn back to pulp or something like that. We get all sorts of <laughs> queries. Um, these fibres are designed to transport moisture and that's what they do incredibly well. So when you're building a building, you've got to assume it's going to get soaking wet. We live in England, you know, it rains a lot. So using materials that uh, prevent the drying of a structure and it, it is, not, is not great. It, it, um, it puts extra stress on the, on the wood. It can cause other problems with mould growth. So again, if you use these natural fibers, you're, you're using a material which will dry out faster than just about anything else. So that improves the durability of the structure um, and, and actually the durability on the site of the, of the design. Uh, sustainability, as you kind of expect from natural fibers, they, they, they're eminently sustainable. Um, in terms of the actual energy used to produce them, um, typically wood fiber is around about 30% less than mineral wool, but it can be twice as much as, uh, two or three times as much as glass fiber. But that doesn't include the carbon that is actually locked into the plant. So when you, when you include that in the, in the whole um, uh, assessment, you find that a lot of these materials are actually carbon negative. So by using them, you're um, uh, you're locking away carbon into your building. And because insulation is by far the most voluminous material in a building, it's really important that you don't use very energy intensive materials which produce huge amounts of CO2 right at the beginning of the life of the building um, and, and cause obviously further climate problems. Um, I'm gonna very quickly get through because I appreciate I'm running out of time. Thermal insulation, looking just at thermal conductivity um, is a bit like saying the best car on the road is the fastest car. If you, if you tell a Welsh sheep farmer that you should be driving a, a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or something, they're not gonna be that impressed. You can't, you can't use this kind of cars for carrying sheep and driving around fields. So it's about horses for courses. Um, using heavyweight materials actually can give you lower heating requirement over the course of the year, simply because they, they store and release heat much more effectively than very, very lightweight insulation materials, which the synthetic ones tend to be. Um, lastly, are there any risks from retrofitting? Um, yes, there are, and, um, but that's our job to kind of assess whether any particular design is, is going to be a problem. But it's mainly about moisture and how particular materials behave with it. Um, using uh, a lot of impervious materials generally causes uh, an increase in the moisture content of masonry, which can then affect timber and steel and cause rotting. And again, you're raising moisture content, so again, mold can be an issue as well. So what we do, we use um, a hydrothermal modeling tool called Woofy, um, which is software. This is actually a, a section through a wall um, and it shows that the top line, the red line is, is a temperature uh, guide and the bottom graph there shows relative humidity and, and moisture content. And from that, we can see where there's any sort of buildup of moisture at any particular point during the course of whatever period we, we model it. It could be seven years, it could be 10 years where we're, we're checking that you're not gonna get an issue. Uh, and then you can actually break that down into individual layers and see exactly what that layer is doing. So again, we can make sure that we are uh, working within the limits. Um, very quickly, uh, we're involved in a, in a project uh, with the, that is EU funded where we're recycling 
uh, polyester fiber from bedding and mixing that with natural fibers to produce new insulation. Uh, and again, we're, we're trying to reduce the amount of, of uh, waste basically, or, which is perfectly good polyester going into landfill, um, recycling it, mixing it with natural fibers and then using it as insulation. Thank you very much. Sorry, overrun. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you, Chris. Um, that was a very good introduction. Um, if anyone's got questions for Chris, please put them in the chat box. We'll have a Q&A session at the end and um, we will run through them. Um, let me now introduce Chris Morgan, who is our next speaker. So Chris is an architect and a director at John Gilbert's Architect with over 30 years experience in ecological design and sustainable development. He has maintained a range of experience from master planning and energy infrastructure through to award-winning and innovative architecture, research and teaching. He was previously a chair of the Scottish Ecological Design and Chris is one of the four, only four architects with advanced sustainable architecture accreditation from the RIS. He's a design review panelist for the Architecture and Design Scotland and has certification in passive house design, building biology and permaculture. So over to Chris. I didn't realize you were gonna read that out fully like that. So um, can you, can everybody see? It's all good. That? Yeah, perfect. Is okay, right, thank you, thank you all. Um, right, what am I time? Um, okay. Natural materials and retrofit. Um, I uh, use natural materials in, or we use natural materials in new build and in retrofit. I, I've broken them down into the three sort of groups that I tend to think of them as a sort of masonry type things, which a lot of which are used for retrofit because we're wanting to use traditional materials uh, generally where we can. Um, and then uh, materials associated with timber in the middle there. And then the sort of agricultural stroke animal uh, fibers that Chris was mainly talking about there um, and other sort of random things which are quite good fun when you get into the mycelium and things like that it's terrific fun some of that stuff um, but I won't go into it um, I, I reckon I can add three advantages to Chris's eight <laughs> in case it's useful one of the main reasons that we're interested in natural, natural materials is because you are saving the energy now i think we've all probably read about how quickly we need to decarbonize and one of the disadvantages of things like renewables is that you have this carbon sort of hiccup where you you have to spend carbon to, to save it later and that's cool but the trouble is that the savings we make in the next sort of five to ten years are, are much more valuable to us than the savings we're going to make in 20 30 years so uh it it, it, it the savings we make with low embodied carbon are, are better than the savings we're going to make in the future with renewables um, uh, using natural materials, the things I've got in bold uh, are the big advantages that you you know you can compost or biodegrade everything safely, uh, and that's really good for zero waste options. Um, and and as someone who grew up in the countryside and has a sort of fairly keen sense of rural depopulation and degeneration generally, um, one of the really lovely things about using natural materials is that you tend to support the sort of industries that exist in the countryside and support farmers and foresters and all of these sort of things. And I would far rather my money or the construction industry's money went there rather than the petrochemical industry. So um, I think there are other reasons. The other thing which Chris touched on is that the disadvantages of, of natural materials actually force you to know what you're doing. You become a better designer because you have to understand things like moisture in particular, which a lot of architects don't understand. Anyway, I'll speed up a few things that are just fun to show you. This is a house for my mother. It was built out of straw and clay, which you can see on the top left. Sheep's wool in the floor, wood chip, clay and straw plaster, handmade clay and straw, not bought from Chris. I think this is probably before his time, but um, and, and the only unburnt bricks in Scotland. Um, it's a bit of a cheat because my mother wanted a planted roof, but um, you know, it's 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 a nice building. Um, every year my daughter and I go and do maintenance on the roof, so that's nice. Um, this is a straw bale building and again it's all timber and straw and lime and clay paint and so on and so forth um round pole construction and sort of yachting fixings for bracing um that that grass roof has now been ripped out and it's a strawberry it's a strawberry patch the daftest strawberry patch in scotland um, but it's nice uh, this is the glencoe business centers which some of you might know since a few years ago but it was the the, the, the one of the big things about this building was that it was a um, completely built out of Scottish timber, which hadn't been treated in any way. So that was a really big deal for us as designers. So there was no chemical treatment in that, and it's uh, durable without chemicals and uh, things like, you know, timber plank roofing instead of thatch and so on and so forth. So 
for all Scottish timber. And that was, that was really important at the time for us to demonstrate that that was possible. Um, for, for even more local, this is um, a, a compost toilet because I'm the guy for glamour, but um, it's for a forest school, but uh, enables them to, to, to be there all day rather than just a few hours. But that, that building was built from literally from the trees around the site. And uh, it's just really nice to be able to do that if you've got the right contractors. And you can see the tree that it came from or one of them. Um, and this is a glorious thing, which unfortunately never got built in the end or it got, it got about halfway. But this was a client who wanted their building to be entirely out of either waste materials or natural materials. Um, and so the, the engineering testing that you see in the top left there is tire bales and earth. Uh, and there aren't many engineers who will, who will test a building like that um, structurally. So it was terrific fun, but it didn't get finished in the end, which is a shame. Um, this is about, about retrofit though. The, the, the most constructive thing I can probably tell you is to, to, to get this uh, guide um, it's free to download from those two websites. Uh, you can just download a PDF or you can buy a copy at 10 quid, which is cost, but um, it's, about a, it's about a whole range of holistic things to do with the renovation. But a, a big part of that is the use of natural materials and vapor permeability and that sort of thing. Um, it has drawings like this in it. Uh, these are the sort of things you might encounter. Roofs across Britain tend to be roughly the same. Uh, the sort of insulation you want, as Chris said, is soft and squishy or, or springy as he described it. Um, you really don't want, if possible, to use rigid materials in between timber joists. It's not a good way. The U values look better. The performance is almost certainly not better. Um, and one thing I'd add is that you can see in that attic picture there, there's a sort of green membrane. One of the things, one of the disadvantages of squishy materials, however, is that you, um, you get this thermal thing called thermal bypass. So cold, cold is wicked away from them on the cold side. Um, and to prevent that and to sort of optimize performance, it's, it's best if you put a sort of breather membrane over them. But most people don't do that. So it's just to say that when you're when you're um, upgrading your loft. Um, internal wall insulation. This is a, a, an image uh, that shows on the left non-natural insulation applied poorly, and on the right natural insulation applied well. And the 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 cartoon is is about showing that there are in fact eighteen ways in which you can basically mess it up uh, on the left. And so you think you've done a good thing. You've put insulation on the wall. Surely that's a good thing. There are 18 ways in which you can essentially not achieve a good thing. And, and, and all of those 18 ways on the right way, that can be, that can be solved uh, just by uh, awareness, use of materials, detail, and so on and so forth. So if people are interested, that's worth knowing about. And, and, and again, vapor permeability is critical there. It's not a sort of nice eco thing. It's a critical performance factor. Uh, on the outside, it is actually less critical. And certainly for us as architects, we are now almost bound to use non-combustible materials externally because of our insurance. We, we simply can't use combustible materials now. Um, and, and natural materials are considered combustible. Um, so we're, we're stuffed really at that at the moment. But again, there's quite a lot of detailing that can help you improve performance. With Tim, with windows, obviously timber windows are better. That sheep's wall being pressed into the um, in, into the, the gap between the windows, various details on, on, on the right. But the thing to remember about windows is that there are actually sort of 10 ways that windows either lose or gain heat. Um, so when you're thinking about windows in renovation, don't just go, oh, that one's got a really good U value. There's actually quite a lot to it, particularly about the way that it's, it joins the wall. Am I okay for time? Yeah. Um, Floors are much more important than people think uh, for various reasons, not just the U value, but actually the air leakage. Um, and we, I, I teach a thing called thermal comfort. Humans are sort of disproportionately inclined towards warm feet and cool heads. So uh, anything you can do to make your floor warm will be disproportionately beneficial to the people in that building. Um, hence underfloor heating, et cetera, et cetera. I, I won't talk about the diagrams too, but um, I hope that there is no nuance in this message please remember ventilation when improving buildings. It, it, it's really critical for the same reasons in, in many cases that natural materials are better than synthetic ones. We're trying to protect people's health as well as save energy. A very, very quick case study, just two or three pictures. This is a, a stone tenement in Glasgow. It's, it will be finished in about a week's time or two weeks time. Um, uh, it is a passive house level renovation or an NFIT it's called, um, stripped back fairly. It is a demonstration project really in many ways. Um, but it wasn't just about the energy efficiency. We wanted to showcase the use of natural materials and, and health and a healthy approach or a health supporting approach. Um, those are all the things. I don't think I've got time to go through them all, but the bit that matters probably is on the, the top right there to do with 
on the front wall where we can't insulate externally, we need to insulate it internally. And once we're doing that, we really, really need to be thinking about vapor permeable and preferably natural materials. So that's where that features, particularly um, on, the, on that north wall, we took out all the cement pointing, we replaced the stone. So again, lime and new stone for me are natural materials used in renovation, but it's nothing to do with insulation. It's about protecting the condition of the wall though on the outside and on the inside, uh, rather than use a sort of plastic membrane for air tightness, we used a lime plaster. So that's lime plaster being used as an air tightness layer straight onto the stone and it also reduces thermal bypass. So we don't have air floating about inside the building. Uh, then you can see on the right, the wood fiber boards are on the inside of that because we quite carefully assessed what the moisture risks were. Um, and uh, this is actually a different flat. It's the top floor flat because they're finished now, but uh, you can see that little bit on the roof there, but um, you know, it, it looks like a normal flat, which was very much an important thing for the uh, client in this case. Uh, another WIFI diagram, the, I won't talk about it, but generally just to say that we, through a, a practical application of WIFI was that we were able to show that the floor joists in the north wall would decay or could decay, there was a risk of it. And so we, we, we took them out and we, uh, we, we, we designed a, a, a way where the, the timber doesn't go into the wall basically. And that was important because it was more expensive. Um, and that's it. So I, I hope that was interesting and I hope I haven't rushed it too much. Thank you, Chris. That was great. Um, we're doing good for time. Um, okay, so any questions for Chris again, please put them in the chat box. Um, so now we've got Gregor Mitchell from Gregor Mitchell Architects. So Gregor Mitchell Architects are an Edinburgh-based practice. Director Gregor Mitchell is an award-winning architect and certified passive house designer, specializing in innovative economic and energy efficient projects for homeowners and commercial clients. Um, Gregor provides bespoke consultancy and assessment services for private clients, architectural practices and leading academic institutions. Is also an experienced designer of retrofit projects who regularly incorporates the use of natural materials into his projects and is currently undertaking PAS 2035 training with the Retrofit Academy. Gregor is also employed as a part time tutor at the University of Edinburgh. Over to you, Gregor. Okay. Okay, you can see me now. So here goes with sharing the screen. Okay, can you see it? Is that working? All good, all good. Okay, that's very good. Okay, so I had the bio. Um, I'm quite humbled to come after um, Chris and uh, Chris. So, um, so from my part, um, what I'm trying to do with the presentation is to offer some guidance through a number of retrofit projects that I've undertaken over the last 12 years, mainly in Edinburgh, but I do work throughout Scotland. Um, all use wood fibre insulation, uh, which as Chris said, utilises waste soft wood materials and also using rigid boards and flexible bat insulation. Um, I would suggest though that although it is all about wood fibre, the principles and lessons learned will also apply to other natural insulations. So the um, the start of a project, I mean, or throughout the project, the client is at the heart of the process. So that question is, how do you communicate um, natural materials to clients, especially private clients? Maybe if they're doing this for the first time. So, I mean, clients want to insulate, but they don't know what to use or where to use it. Um, I mean, saying that some clients do know exactly what they want to use, can have a huge amount of knowledge, where others complain of cold feet and high fuel bills and let you get on with it. Um, but as part of what I do um, as an initial step, I always undertake a feasibility study um, of the property to ascertain the approach that might be taken for the retrofit. And as part of that, I use 3D modeling and passive house tools as well. I won't go into any more detail about that. That's a separate, completely separate topic. Um, so what the outcomes will depend on the building typology, the age, the condition, um, but fundamentally with what I do, natural installation materials are always central, um, as well as, of course, a fabric first approach. But um, I suppose looking at projects, often uh, 
you know, a larger project which incorporates retrofit insulation works will have extensions, alterations throughout. So it makes sense to actually retain the same DNA to the new build works because essentially with operations on site, having consistent materials helps with procurement and costs. So again, this idea of communication, there's a lot of physics that's been run through already. Um, one thing I do sort of, I suppose, work on with clients is this idea of, um, you know, the decrement delay, which I feel is very important when trying to justify um, an insulation like wood fibre. So really the analogy I use, architects love to use analogies because we're sort of simple minded people, but it's fundamentally that a stone wall and the wall of a caravan share the same U value. But when you consider how quickly heat passes through a caravan wall, that really expresses the difference um, in terms of the, um, you know, the, the mass of the material you're using with the wood fibre. And that's usually quite persuasive. Other clients like to see samples. They like to touch and smell it, which is also very persuasive. And some even try to eat it. But um, it generally it works well and clients are generally on board quite quickly. So in terms of the approach, there's a lot of complex images here. I mean, what I'm expressing really is the sort of study of undertake of properties. What I'm looking for is to understand the nature of the existing property, which is really important at the start of the project. So I spend a lot of time surveying it, drawing it, investigating it. So there I'm comparing different um, approaches. The one on the left is uh, the existing building. The one, the two following ones show different types of insulation in different locations. And this is the sort of information that I will generate for, uh, you know, for the Passive House software. But ultimately, the end of that process, um, I should have established the, the correct approach for the project with insulation as well as potentially the uh, space heating demand. So there's, I'll give you an indication now of some of the approaches using wood fiber. Um, the first one is external wall insulation, which Chris has already covered. So. I find with external wall insulation, it does enable you to have thicker layers of insulation than you would use internally. And this would usually be built up in layers. I mean, it is quite a, a cumbersome and time consuming process. Um, and the, it can also you know, result in a marked change in the external appearance, which I'm gonna indicate on in the next slide. Um, I would say that work to the exterior of the building will usually be considered as what you would call permitted development. If it's on a non-listed building, in a non-conservation area. Otherwise, changes should probably be formalized. So the slides are just showing the, the application of the material in layers. I've shown the window details. You get a good overlap with the frame with that detail, which further enhances the thermal performance. And um, as noted before, the fire performance is, is obviously critical, um, which may be part of the discussion later on. So this is just a, an image of a house in Edinburgh. It was kind of a modest 1950s bungalow, um, which has been fairly radically changed by the application of the external wall insulation. Um, I would say it's somehow Germanic in flavor, which isn't a bad thing, but it does result in quite a big change for the existing dwelling. So looking at internal wall insulation, um, this is an example from a converted building in Edinburgh, which uses a tablet by board. So I did pick up on one of the questions regarding the incorporation of the hardwoods. So this material is effectively, you know, for want of a better word, tiled on the inside of the wall. So what's really important with this is, as any decorator will say, it's all in the preparation. So to get a flat, smooth surface using a lime parge coat internally is fundamental to the functionality of the board because what you get with that is a full contact with have a, have, have a dry boards uh, which aids the in transfer of any moisture. Um, I suppose with internal wall insulation because of the danger of condensation you will use less you know board thickness. I think the rule of thumb is about 80 mil wood fiber insulation which will result in a, a lower U value than that would be um, prescribed by the regulations but my experience with building control is that they do understand that U-value is not fundamental to good performance ultimately. So they will accept this as a solution. So moving on the same project, in this one we used over rafter insulation. So this is, I suppose, effectively similar to external wall insulation. 
it uh, creates a continuous wind type layer of insulation above the rafters and it's really good for attic spaces where you don't want to lose height. Um, it will involve stripping the entire roof finish, um, but um, I think it's probably advisable to do that anyway if you're doing a, an attic conversion because old existing roofs can often leak and you just don't want any moisture in the insulation. So this is the outside of the building. So there's not been um, a fundamental change. I mean, the stonework's intact. The original apertures are intact. The change, I suppose, is limited to the eaves. So with the application of the um, over after insulation, the roof does sit up slightly, but I was suggesting the scheme of things is not you know, it's not a radical change for the building itself. So, I mean, internal wall insulation ultimately is difficult, I suppose, if you have um, good internal features like cornicing, architrave, et cetera. So looking at uh, insulation to suspended floors, um, it can seem really disruptive, though I would suggest it's really cost-effective and thermally effective. So these are just some images showing the, the process of stripping back creating the platform for the insulation, the insulation, then the finish. So um, floors, I suppose, are problems with air leakage, especially around the perimeter. So this is a, an approach I often take on projects, projects where some sort of external wall insulation or internal wall insulation is not feasible. So in terms of risk, I suppose, I mean, you know, anything to do with design incorporates risks fundamentally, but what we suggest with natural insulations is that you get really good technical advice, not just with good fiber, but with warm cell, with any of the companies supplying this. And they will um, have resources in terms of carrying out U-value calculations. They'll give you a full breakdown of the, of the, of the components, of the elements. They'll do uh, quantity takeoffs of drawings. And I mean, these guys know the systems and they will aid the whole procurement process, which is a really recommended if you've got a contractor that is unfamiliar with the, the system. So they'll also give you uh, BBA certificates as well as a full list of components that you need. So this is really important to get this information because it's easy to miss out the correct fixings or cakes, et cetera. So everything has to be compatible with the actual nature of the system you're using. Uh, so in terms of costs, I'll run through really quickly here. Um, it is more expensive. I mean, it's, it's the same cost generally per centimeter thickness as a, say, a phenolic board, but you do need more uh, thickness to achieve the U value. There's also obviously an increase in costs um, across the board with insulation. Um, so I'm not sure whether it's more with, you know, oil prices going up, whether it's more applicable to phenolic uh, insulations. Um, but why we tend to do on projects is use an experienced QS, an early stage of the process, just to really understand the costs and ultimately be honest about it. You know, this stuff might cost more, but there are obviously clear advantages um, to it. Uh, sorry, I've missed a slide there. <laughs> anyway, so um, this is a, it's just an indication of a project I'm working on at the moment, which is a, an Enerfit project in Midlothian. Um, Projects can be complex, so it's important at an early stage to build up a good relationship with the builder, share knowledge, um, communication is key, but I would say that it's a two-way process. I mean, a lot of builders now have experience of natural insulations and they know where to get it, how to use it. So you can often learn off them as well. So moving on to the site stage, which I suppose is the most demanding stage of the project. Um, existing buildings can be very unpredictable. And these slides, you know, the first slide, for instance, is showing you know, the storage of the natural insulation, the, the boards, and they do take a large volume. So you have to find a good dry place to store them, which in this case is not dry. And also as you strip back finishes to expose internal walls, there can be the sort of proverbial can of worms exposed. You can have rotting uh, sarking boards, you know, walls that are crumbling, gas pipes, etc. So these are all things you don't know before you start work. And there can also be, you know, major cracks and brickwork, etc. So these are all things that are unpredictable, but ultimately when you do the work, it's good to do repairs to buildings because the building itself will ultimately last longer. And also on site, some of the tricky interfaces with uh, wood fibre, uh, the base course, where you need to have a separation at DPC level between the, the, um, 
which is generally XBS installation and the upper board. So there's usually a carrier um, profile for that. Also services, external walls can have vents, flues, et cetera. So you have to you know, work around them. And there's always a risk of motor, water ingress to these as well. And also upstands, uh, you know, looking at that image inside of a dormer where these are flashings, et cetera. So these are all, if you like, risk points in the construction. And also windowsills, using windowsills that have upstands at the side. So these are all things that can be tricky to detail, but ultimately once you have the experience of it and you have a good contractor, that it's usually not a problem on site. And the also on site, you know, for the contractor, you know, new to the game, you know, it's a case of using tools that are specific to the product, using saw blades that are slightly you know, curved so that the material doesn't get cut, uh, caught in the blades. Um, long and bespoke fixings can cause problems as well. I mean, that image on the bottom left is actually using the wrong fixings. So they were taken out, but obviously the use of metal with a rendered finish is not advisable. There's also a lot of debris from cutting of materials and a lot of disgruntled joiners on site. So I often get moans when I go to site because they'll say to me, oh, it's in my nose, my eyes, it's terrible. But the question really is, would you rather have that or would you rather have beads of um, you know, phenolic insulation? So I think the, the question answers itself. But also another thing I do find on site is there's a huge amount of waste that contractors will dump everything in a skip. So you have to go back and retrieve what you can because all that insulation I'm showing on the right is useful. You can pack it in. It should not be binned full stop. So generally contractors you know, with experience will understand that. And onto the last side, um, that diagram really, all it really expresses, it's not to do with natural insulation, but all it's saying is that it's looking at the opportunity for influence and it's saying that the key is to think and act early. So really front load, load the process to maximize the benefit. And that's it, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gregor. Um, that was great. Um, so we will start our Q&A session now. Please keep posting your question in the chat box. We'll pick them up from there. Um, so we're bringing everyone forward. Um, let's start maybe with some questions for Chris Brookman, just giving Gregor a break for now. <laughs> um, so uh, maybe the first one is um, questions is, uh, do you find that there are some incompatibilities with the natural materials when used together? I'm wondering if about question about for plastering on wood fiber with clay or lime. So it's not, it's not incompatibilities. It, most of the materials are perfectly compatible. It's just about the practicality of it. Um, clays don't stick particularly well to wood fiber. So you would generally use lime and, and specifically engineered limes as well, not just um, you know, lime putty or, or a hydraulic lime mix. Um, you would use that first and then you would put clay or something over the top. But it's, it's um, yeah, there's no incompatibility. It's just purely the, the, the um, properties of the material that don't make it particularly suitable. Okay, great. Um, and I guess all those informations can be found uh, well, people can ask suppliers and all this can be found. Yeah. Yeah. Um, good. Uh, another question is, uh, what if you do have vinyl windows just with plastic UPVCs? Um, how do you marry them into a natural wall system? Not ideal, but not itself a problem. And that's coming from someone who often works. No, that was me trying to be helpful by answering before the. Oh, right, sorry, <laughs> sorry. sorry. And then okay. you said, stop answering. No, just, sorry, just, stop. Okay. <laughs> so, do you want to actually answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think, I mean, it, it, it's not ideal because, um, but uh, I, I don't think there are any sort of specific problems with that. It's just, um, I mean, the fundamental thing with PVC, apart from the fire risk, is that it's, uh, you know, it's not vapor permeable. So, any moisture doing any moving around them will move through whatever's next to it. So, um, you know, you've just got to be aware of that. But it's, put it this way, if you've got PVC windows, it doesn't necessarily mean you should take them out. It's, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question on wood fiber. Someone asking about basements and tanking and how compatible is that? 
Mm, that's a good one. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's technically possible, but again, it's about risk. Um, if you can absolutely 100% guarantee that you have waterproof the walls of the basement, then yes, it is technically possible. I tend not to recommend wood fiber for basements purely because um, I'm slightly more risk averse when I'm putting my neck on the line for a specification. Yeah. Um, I would rather people use synthetic materials in that location um, because the risk of damage um, and actually the way that they go together is slightly easier. Um, and then I would tend to use uh, wood fiber in a more dynamic situation because again below ground it's just dull there's not much going on you've got pretty steady temperature gradient across there you've got a pretty steady um, moisture content on both sides there's not really a lot going on so th there's not that much benefit to using wood fiber other than the environmental benefits of, mm. of the product itself but above ground you've got all the performance benefits so I would generally use it above ground okay um I've got a question for Chris Morgan um someone um commenting on your tenement renovation and uh, asking what do you think of the feasibility of rolling out this type of renovation into other such buildings? I think it's fine. I mean, people say that about all sorts of things. I mean, I built straw bale buildings 20 years ago and people said, well, that's all very well, but could you actually do that more often? And the answer is, of course you can. You just choose to, <laughs> you just choose to do it. It's just a performance thing. If you want a better performance, do a better performance. Uh, yeah, people say that a lot actually about these sort of things, you know. Um, oh, well, uh, it's all very well to use earth in a rural situation, but what about urban? Well, the advantages remain exactly the same. I think for most of us, and I imagine Chris would agree with this, or both of them would agree, um, it's, it is it is obviously a sustainability issue, but it is primarily a, a sort of functioning performance thing. That's what we're trying to achieve. So it's not sort of cute eco, it's better performance under certain circumstances. So th there's absolutely no reason not to do better performing <laughs> retrofit yeah. You know, um, the, the only thing practically I would say was that I know the contractor had trouble getting the right line guys in because they had, I know they had had problems in the past with air tightness and I'd made it abundantly clear that the line plaster was going to be the air tightness layer and they weren't to mess it up. And um, I think they, they knew that some of the people they got initial quotes from probably weren't good enough. Um, okay. So it took some time to get the line plaster sorted, but the guys who turned up seemed fine. It was okay. So there's no reason though, I think. Okay, um, then still for you, I actually have got a question about the wood fiber internal insulation fixed directly to the lime plaster. And then was it plastered over directly again? Yes, yes. Okay, and, um, and so there's a further question about the choice ends. Um, if they had not been spurted from the walls, would this detail have caused uh, no, it wasn't. water build up? It wasn't moisture in the uh, in the in the wall or the insulation that was the issue. It was the, it was well, sorry. It was moisture in the wall and therefore anything organic within the wall. So it was moisture in the timber joist that was the issue. There wasn't a moisture risk in the wood fiber because the wood fiber perfectly wicks moisture away, or at least you know unless there's a problem. Um, it was the timber joist sitting in a more or less permanently cold, wet stone wall that was the issue. Okay. Um. Then I've got further question. Someone asking if uh, rigid insulation is not recommended between joists, would you recommend mineral wool or for locked insulation, wood fiber insulation for internal wall insulation and stone wall? I don't know if we want. No. I think that goes directly. I'm just wondering where that is actually. So, yeah. I mean, you can, I mean, as long as it's hygroscopic, I try not to, but you can sometimes use in a timber frame construction use the wood fiber outer board and then use you know an earth wool or something between the studs i mean it's not you're not getting the same mass and density of the material but um you can you can interchange materials as long as they're they've got the breathability ultimately mm. good um we've got another question more on materials about cellulose um someone questioning uh, whether cellulose can actually be considered as natural materials because of all the chemical processes that goes into it. Mm. Um, does anyone got a bit of insight in that? Uh, I can answer them. It, cellulose is a perfectly natural material. The other things you add to it aren't necessarily. So yeah. um, yes, there, there inevitably is you know, some um, impact from, from having uh, the actual ink in the newsprint, mm. um, but 
again, it's about sort of a circular economy and, and using what is effectively a waste material, or it can largely be recycled, but it wouldn't be recycled um, for anything particularly useful, It'd go into cardboard or something low grade. Um, so again, it's about using you know materials which are available. It, it has its own specific properties, which are different to a lot of other things, and it, it, it is a very useful material. So it's useful to, to think of all of these different materials as a palette that, that which you can pick and choose from to select um, uh, to create a, a, you know the, the final building that you want and, and how it how it needs to perform. So you know you don't only use one material through the whole building. It's worth saying, Aurora, that actually, I mean, 20 years ago, um, cellulose, recycled cellulose was considerably cheaper than most other natural insulation. So when, if we were trying to do mostly or quite natural as, as, as an improvement on anything else, cellulose was by far the cheapest way to go. So we used cellulose a great deal because, <laughs> because it was affordable um, and we're always under pressure um, with cost. Yeah. Okay. Um going to technical someone's asking whether suppliers do woofy calculations or yeah okay <laughs> we do <laughs> okay you do. Nice do. Some nice do. do yes Some do, yeah and um while we're on that uh someone's asking if there are any technical advisors in the southeast <laughs> um is that some is there a network of technical advisors or is that more actually suppliers that are doing the technical side of things or uh, i think you... there are i think that there's technical advisors all over that a really useful place to find who is in your locality is actually the members list on the aecb directory um i quite often point people towards there because you know i can't possibly know who's everywhere so okay. um, a lot of people have joined the aecb it's a, it's a really useful resource we put that link into the party bag later on so everyone's got this to refer to um, and um, someone's asking Gregor if you are finding that small con small contractors are a bit more flexible about working with less standard materials than big contractors. Yes, I mean they need to. I suppose they need to be trained up. Often, I, I suppose. I mean, a lot of them. I mean, the construction industry is really traditional. You know, the way that it's set up, the trades, etc., and it's very adversarial as well. So it can be problematic. But then I suppose what you do is you build up a relationship with the contractor and you bring them on, they bring you on at the same time. So that, that kind of closeness is, is really valuable with this. And ultimately they get trained up by say, you know, MBT when they existed and they get the badge in their van and they're quite happy about it. So I think there is an, an incentive for them ultimately to do this. And uh, they may not understand the building physics, but mm. I think in terms of reputation and you know, especially working with me as well, in continuity, they tend to want to upskill. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, I sorry, just going through the list. Um, got someone asking. Uh, it's more on uh, the air tightness layer when it's made um, by using the lime plaster. Is there anything specifically you had to be careful about? No gaps anywhere ever no. <laughs> Full contact. Yeah. there was a lot of red pen on our drawings while well, the equivalent of red pen but uh you know because there's loads of daft bits where you know you go the underside of joist and then penetrations and cables mm -hmm. that come through i mean there's just hundreds of those things so it was just about making it abundantly clear <laughs> and then keeping an eye on things um but they they were concerned themselves because they have done passive house projects and had problems with air tightness so they were they were self-monitoring for what it's worth Okay, mm -hmm. um, maybe a last couple of questions actually going back to wood fiber. Um, someone's asking if any of you is aware of any plans to turn to British forestry for uh, manufacturing uh, insul uh, wood fiber insulation. And um, yeah, they were, yeah, they were looking at this, weren't they, at the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre, Chris? In, I was thinking, yeah, I mean, they yeah. did try it a wee bit in Scotland, but I think Chris will probably know, Chris B will probably know better than us in England, but uh, Gregor yeah, and I are both the, Scottish. The, the, yeah. the challenge is that um, transport is too cheap relative to the cost of the material and certainly relative to the cost of a, of a factory. And also our timber industry is piffling compared to the European t uh, timber industry. So you need a massive amount of feedstock, which they have in Europe because they've got a lot of timber. Um, and the cost of building a factory might be 
I don't know, between 20 and 50 million pounds, the market just isn't big enough yet to support that. And all because also the amount that that factory would produce would completely flood the market and drop the prices enormously. So the economics, I don't think stack up yet unless there's government help. So, you know, it, anything can be done with government help, but, uh, you know, pure market economics at the moment don't support it, I don't think. Yeah, there is a company in Scotland called, um, I think it's called Indie Breathe, actually, who are using Indie Nature. Yeah, Indie Nature, okay. Yeah. So, they're, yeah, doing, they're doing hemp. It's hemp, yeah. There's quite a lot of other things apart from mm. wood fiber. Um, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I guess one last question before we wrap up. Um, it's a big one. Um, maybe a few of you want to answer that one. And how do you do to persuade a client to go for a natural material? Uh, native charm, charm or a native charm. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I think you don't tell them, you just do it. <laughs> okay. You know, so uh, no, but they, you have to be trustworthy. You have to know, yeah. you have to demonstrate that you know what you're talking about. Yeah. And you have to be able to demonstrate to them that it's not a risk or it's an acceptable level of risk. Mm. It's also the benefits, the, the, the benefits um, in terms of the experience that you have inside of the building that's insulated with these kind of materials compared to synthetic materials is A, you can't put a value on it because we don't have a value measure for comfort. Uh, and B, you know, there, there is, there's just no comparison. They are completely different entities. So generally when people understand that, it, it sells itself. Yeah, but I'll also add in as well that I suppose if it's a retrofit, you have more control as a as a consultant or architect in the process because if you're building a new house, for instance, and you you know procure a timber frame, often a client will go out to various companies who produce timber frames with phenol insulation. So generally, as a retrofit, you can you know in terms of the specification, that will be effectively the bible for the project. So you do have more control over these projects, I think. Certainly smaller ones, anyway. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. I think it's just time for us to wrap up. Um, thank you very much to, um, to our speakers. So um, thank you everyone for coming. It's been great. Uh, so um, I'm just going to quickly wrap up with what we're doing over the next few months at ACAN. So we'll be holding more natural material events with the return of our master classes in June for a session focused on building with lime. So watch out for that one. Um, also, ACAN is a voluntary organization, so if you'd like to donate to fund an event like this, we'll post a, a link in the chat box now. Also, to help us to understand our audience better and to highlight the main barriers to using natural materials, we're currently running a survey. Please do participate if you haven't already. The link will be posted in the chat now again. And finally, if you'd like to join us at ACAN Natural Materials, the link to the WhatsApp group would be posted in the chat now, or you can email us at naturalmaterials at architectscan.org. Um, also, there will be a follow-up party bag with a roundup for this event. So information on the speakers and further resources. So do watch out for that in your inbox soon from Evan Bright if you would like to, to do some more reading. Thank you again to all our, of our speakers for a brilliant evening and thank you everybody for coming. We hope to see you again soon.